In this module of Management Science 352, I'm going to talk a little bit about waiting lines, going by the fancy name of queuing theory. I will talk about the basics of waiting lines on this particular clip and save examples and work with the waiting lines template to other clips. Okay. That just makes it a little easier to, to digest and split things up in this particular module. So why the heck do we care about this thing called waiting lines, other than we're frustrated as hell when we have to wait in one? Uh, waiting lines is essentially that thing that builds up in front of your bottleneck, right? We have a bottleneck, and the bottleneck can only handle so much, but the process in front of that bottleneck can has a higher throughput than the bottleneck does. And if that higher throughput process isn't somehow regulated or slowed down, we'll get a buildup of work in progress in front of whatever that bottleneck is. That buildup is just another word for a waiting line. Okay. So when we talk about waiting lines, we're not necessarily talking about whether people are in the waiting lines. It could also be things in the waiting lines, things to get processed, things to be transformed, and so on. Okay. So waiting lines don't just concern people, although they certainly do. They also concern things as well. Okay. Now, English being quite the uh, evolutionary language, it's kind of neat to see where words come from. So when we talk about queuing theory or the idea of a queue, which we now kind of know to be sort of a old English word for lineup, which it was since the 19th century, but not always the case. So in the 15th century, it was referred to the tail of the beast, a queue, and then it became a braid of hair, later to be a pigtail. And then somehow it goes from tail of the beast and braid of hair to a billiard stick. I don't get that leap, but boy, I don't know how anybody learns English. And then it went from that billiard stick to how we know and now know it is to, to line up. So pretty wild how that word has changed. Okay, a couple of key concepts when we start talking about waiting lines. First concept is our idea of a customer population. Just like I said a couple seconds ago, that customer population doesn't necessarily refer, refer solely to humans. It could also refer to things as well. Okay, So that's our input to the service system. So it's just generically considered to be anything that goes into the service system, whether it's human or not human. Okay? The source of this customer population is considered finite or infinite. Uh, now, of course, infinite being more theoretical, uh, infinite in our case, in the applied case, just refers to a very, very large population. Okay? The math is way easier for infinite populations than it is for finite populations. Okay? So infinite, in order to sort of make for computational ease, is just considered really, really, really large. Okay, So the po customer population for Amazon, the customer population for Walmart, customer population for Sobeys, a co-op, all these places considered to be very, very large. And so from a mathematical perspective, we consider them to be infinite. Okay? By finite, we mean it's very, very small. It's countably small. So for instance, the number of fire trucks that are available at any one time, right? That's a, a fairly small number. The number of ambulances that are uh, on call at any particular moment, fairly, very small number, okay? Uh, so those are countable. The number of trucks that you maybe have available in, a, in, in, your, uh, in your company, right, for maintenance or whatever, right? Very, very small population size there. And we also look at those customers as to whether they're inpatient or patient. Now, that's not saying do they like to be in the line or don't like to be in the line, okay? We can be patient and hate being in the line. Now, patient is just someone who enters the system, gets in the line, and remains in the line until they receive service. Impatient is someone that kind of comes in there, right? Looks at looks at the the system, looks at the lineup, and says, "Ah, this is nuts," and leaves. Okay. Doesn't even come into the system. Just looks in the window and says, "Ah, crap," you know, and and box. Okay. Or there's somebody that, that can be goes into the system, da da da, waiting, waiting, and says, "Ah, 
you know what, life's too short to stand in this lineup for the rest of it, uh, I'm taking off. So they entered the system and then they left. And we call that reneging. Okay. Either way, that's impatient. Okay. So you left the system. Okay. We're going to make the simplifying assumption that people are patient. Okay. Just makes it a little bit easier. Otherwise, you have to model sort of people's behavior. A little bit more probabilities involved in there. Makes the math just uh, layers, puts another layer of mathematical complexity onto it. Okay. Now, when we talk about that system, Okay, so now we move from the customer population and attributes of the customer population into the system. Uh, we now start to think of, okay, what, what does that system look like? Because when we do waiting lines, we're, we're dealing with two big components, right? We're dealing with what happens on the customer side. We're dealing with what happens on the system side. And what makes waiting line really cool is we got certain behaviors on the customer side. We have certain sort of attributes of the system side. And then we see how do they interact with each other? So it's really interesting that way. Uh, so from the system side, we have a couple of attributes to that system. So number of lines, single line versus multiple line. Uh, how they're arranged, right? Is there one or, or or more servers to provide a certain service? Is there one or more steps, right? So phases meaning steps, channels meaning uh, servers. Okay, so we have those kinds of things to consider. Okay? So for instance, I walk into a bank. There may be a line. I have one line, multiple servers, and... Uh, but no more extra phases unless I need something else done. Okay, so if I need to talk to somebody about setting up a new account, then I go from the teller, I, I do my teller work, and then they direct me over to some, somewhere else, uh, and then there's another phase. So there, there would be two phases there and one channel potentially. So here on this little diagram, we see the kind of two major ways to look at systems. And we'll be able to mathematically model and determine which one of those two systems functions better. Okay. So we have the one single line with multiple servers, or just each server has uh, its own line. Okay. Now, people usually consider A to be a much fairer system. I know I prefer A because if I get into any one of these single B lines over here, you can pretty much guess that the intern, the new person, the worst person, the slowest person is the person who's my server. You see me in a line, I can very much guarantee you that is going to be the slowest line. Okay, and then now we can have multiple phases on this. You can kind of see this can get really, really, really involved. And the modeling with waiting lines could really expand to a lot of cool stuff. And a really neat little puzzle develops here, right? You know, whether we're talking about uh, one line, multiple servers, and then perhaps going on to another phase like we have at the very end, or single servers but then you got to go through a couple of steps like an assembly line just lots of ways that we can use these basic elements of waiting lines in, in different processes really really cool stuff okay so basically there's four combos here and a single channel single phase so like the bank like i said it could be a single channel multiple phase well, that could be the bank if you need to get an extra service maybe if you're going to the registrar and you go up to the front and or you go talk to a faculty advisor you go talk to the person up at front and they direct you to someone else and so you have one phase and that's the initial uh reception person that you see at the front and then they direct you to another phase which is the faculty advisor and then maybe if things like get really complicated there may be a third phase where you got to go talk to a to a dean of some sort uh to fix your problem and then there can be multiple channels single phase so it just means multiple different lineups of uh, single phase so the walmart lineup in, in in a large way is like that right? most grocery store lineups are are like that and then there's multiple channel multiple phase right? and that's where you have a bunch of channels a bunch of uh, lineups a bunch of servers and then but there's not there's something else that has to be done after that so our, our waiting line model, we start with our customer population and they arrive. And there's a whole bunch of cool probabilities with their kind of the, how many of them arrive. 
right? So it's really neat. And then they go into the service system. So come off from the population, go into the waiting line. Then there's some priority rule there, right? How are they designated? How do you get into the uh, service facility, right? Is, is it a first come, first serve? Is it uh, some other priority system, right? And there's where, where the interesting uh, things come into, into play, right? So you can kind of still see here where we have the customer's population and they arrive, right? Each one of those individual customers is its own independent being, right? How they arrive, well, there's certain modeling to that. The service facility, as we know, right, how, how many can you serve, how fast you can serve, variability in the service system, right? As we, we well know, you know, variability is one of our, our key sort of ideas or key concepts that we keep track of when someone serves. Some days you're having a good day, sometimes you're having a bad day, right? And we saw that a little bit when we were talking about constraint management. So the service system has variability. And when the service system has variability, the customer population has variability. Hey, we got two probabilities, right? two probability models that are going to interact with each other. And, you know, that's got to be kind of cool. And then the serve customers are on their way out. Okay? So that priority rule, now that can be a controversial one. First come, first serve, you know, okay, that's, you know, somewhat uh, non-controversial. But does that work every time? Right? Not necessarily. You've got a healthcare system. You you arrive in the emergency room of a hospital. It's not first come, first serve. Right? There's a definite priority rule uh, as to who gets seen first. Um, as a student, right? You set priority rules. Which assignment do you do first? Which test do you study for first? And so on. Right? And uh, some some different processes for that. Uh, earliest due date, you do the one that's due the earliest first, and then you kind of prioritize it from there. But maybe that's not the way you want to work it. Sometimes maybe you want to get get those little assignments out of the way, you know, so shortest processing time, and then do the big assignment at the very end where you can just have to focus in on the one thing. So we, as people, when we are organizing our own days, have different rules, right, as far as, far as how, how we allocate our time or our resources, right? Essentially, that's the service system. Uh, so there's a preemptive discipline. So a customer of a higher priority interrupts the service of another higher. So back to the emergency room example, right? You know, you've thought, you've said, you, you've, you're about to be um, served, I guess, for lack of a better term, but an emergency case who comes in uh, just before you're being served, but this other person needs uh, attention more than you do, and boom, you're bumped, right? And we're f it's fairly uncontroversial. Right? First class error versus economy error. First class folks get the board first, economy boards after that, right? So there's a priority rule. So when we start talking about those arrivals, we're modeling those arrivals, and there's variability to that. And so a, a very, very common probability distribution that we use to model arrivals is the Poisson probability distribution. Another one is a, a negative binomial probability distribution. So we're going to worry about the probability distribution, the uh, a Poisson probability distribution, because that's the probability distribution that we saw in Management Science 103. So we remember that the Poisson distribution is a discrete distribution. Okay? So it means we're counting people. Essentially, we're counting people. People come in discrete bunches. We're not talking about pieces of people. We're not serial killers here. Okay? So we're counting people. And um, we can uh, count how many people arrive at any time period using this wonderful Poisson distribution. Okay? So, but it's over some time period. So let's just review some of the basic notation here. So the formula is there, and, and you're doing you're going to be doing this on Excel as well. So the uh, key Excel function Poisson you know, uh, is going to be very very useful to you there as well. Okay, well, we'll talk about that a little later. So uh, P with the little subscript N, it's the probability of a certain number of arrivals in some time period. Right. So this is always going to be within time. 
Okay, so it'll always be within per minute, per hour, per day, per week, per year, whatever. But the time frame has to be specified. And they were basically trying to uh, determine the probability that a certain number of things or people arrive in this time period. Lambda is the average number of customer arrivals per that time, per some time period. Five will arrive per hour. That kind of thing. I got a good old friend E, which uh, if you're doing this by calculator, you're going to want to be able to find that. One of my favorite numbers is E. And then the mean of the distribution is lambda T. So the, the average number of customer arrivals per some time period times by the length of that time period. Okay. What's really nice about the Poisson is that's also equal to the variance. So kind of a neat attribute of the Poisson distribution there. So this example here I will do on another clip, okay, just so that um, we're not bouncing around from screen to screen. Now, we had the arrival modeling, right? We saw Poisson distribution, very nice, well-behaved, not a very complicated distribution. And now we have the service time. So customer arrivals, service time, right? Customers, how many arrive or how many can we can expect to arrive or... Uh, the range of numbers of arrivals. And then how long does it take us to, uh, to deal with those customers? Okay. So we have, when we deal with time, and time is often modeled using an exponential distribution or some similar relation of an exponential distribution, like a gamma distribution. Okay, So we're using exponential. Saw a little bit of that in Management Science 103. And uh, we see the formula listed there on, on the slide. Now, the, the difference between, the key difference between exponential and Poisson is the exponential is a continuous distribution. Okay, so we can only find uh, the probability over some range of uh, values. Okay, probability of exactly five minutes between customers uh, being served is zero okay so being a continuous distribution we're always going to be looking for a cumulative probability uh, less than or equal to some value greater than or equal to some value but other than that again it's not a scary uh, formula to look at so when we look at that uh, one minus e to the minus uh, mu times t i know 24 letters in the greek alphabet we seem to use the same couple of them over and over again so mu is, in this case, an average. So that's good, because we've seen mu as an average before. Uh, mu is the average number of customers completing the service per period. Okay, It's not the number of arrivals. It's the number of customers completing the service. T is the service time of the customer. Uh, a capital T, excuse me, is the service time of the customer. Capital little t is the target service. Uh, target service time, the mean of the service time, so how how long on average in minutes or in seconds or in some unit of time is one over mu. Okay, so if mu was five people or five customers completing the service per minute, it would be five per minute would be mu. What would be the mean service time? It would be how long does it take us to to serve the average customer, which would just be one over five or one fifth of a minute. Okay. The nice thing about the exponential is the variance and the mean are the same. Okay, so again, this example we'll do on another uh, little clip. Okay, a couple other things. So our waiting line models essentially bring those two distributions together. The customers arriving according to a Poisson being served or their service times being modeled using an exponential distribution. A couple of key metrics that we want to really focus in on, and these will be very, very important when it comes to our waiting line template, because these are the key deliverables. Okay. Line the length, right? how long is the line? Uh, and here we have trade-offs. Always have trade-offs, and, and it's been one of the two big things we've talked about all class, one of them being variability, 
right? The other one being trade-offs, right? There's always a, there's always a balance, right? Well, we want that line length to be small because we want good customer service, but we, in order to keep it small, we may have over capacity, which costs us money. And so we're balancing those two uh, objectives. Number of customers in the system, that means number of customers both in the line as well as at the servers or at the machine or whatever. Uh, and there we have our balances is that we, want, we don't want congestion. Uh, we want to minimize dissatisfaction. So we're trying to minimize the number of customers in that system. Waiting time in the line, longer you wait in the line, right? It's our, it affects our perception of, of the quality of service, our importance as customers and human beings. Uh, sometimes that waiting in time in line can be adjusted, you know, by the improved line design. Right? And we sort of maybe looked at that a little bit indirectly. If you remember from your case studies, Right? We're trying to arrange our processes uh, so that we minimize how long it takes for our work in progress, whether it's a thing or a human, to go from one station to another station. That's a similar to waiting in line, right? The faster we go from one station to another station, the less time we're in the system. Uh, total time in the system is an indicator for us, too, because it can indicate problems with customers, right? Maybe customers are, you know, there's education mechanisms that we can use to speed up the, uh, how the customers interact with the system. Uh, we may not have, uh, we maybe have too many or too few servers. Uh, we may have our capacity may be too large or too small. Uh, another key metric that we'll talk about is uh, service facility utilization. So it's a percentage of time the facility is busy. Okay, so all important things. So we have, we'll have we have two kind of major types of models here. One's a, a single server model. The other one will be a multiple server model. So single server model, we have one server, one single line of customers. Okay. In this one, we assume the customers are inf in infinite. So customer population is very, very large, and the customers don't leave the lineup. They're patient. Okay. They arrive according to a Poisson distribution with a certain mean arrival rate of lambda. Okay. Service distribution is exponential. So now we can see how the two distributions are going to be coming together here uh, with a mean service rate of mu. That's the number of customers that we can serve in any particular time. So if lambda, number of customers that arrive in a time period, mu, the number of customers that we can serve in a time period. Note, these are both averages. There is variability to both of these numbers. But the mu must always be greater than n lambda. Think about why that must be the case. We assume that first come first serve modeling. So we're going to try to avoid the complications of priority queuing and uh, the length of uh, waiting line of the waiting line potentially large. So that very, very first letter there is not the uh, letter P, it's the Greek letter Rho, and that is the average utilization of the system. Lambda divided by mu. That can be, that's, uh, and it, that'll, we'll see that when we start working with the template a little bit more. That's a pretty important number for us. P little n is the probability that n customers are in the system. There's a formula there. And you'll see these key formulas on in the text. Uh, the waiting line templates will be the predominant focus on this. We won't actually be doing these calculations by hand. Uh, L is the average, average, average number of customers in the system. Uh, LQ is the average number of customers in the line itself. So L would include folks in the line or things in the line plus those who are being served at that moment, whereas LQ would just be people or things in the line waiting for that service. W is the average time spent in the system, right? both waiting and getting the service, and WQ is the average waiting time in line. Okay. So this particular example that you see here, we will also be doing that on a separate clip. 
Okay, so the other major type of system is the multi-server model. So we had single server model simplified uh, in a multi-server. Math is more involved. It's not impossible, but it is a little bit uh, more laborious to work with if you're using it by hand. Okay. We will use the, the waiting line template uh, in order to do these calculations. Okay, so, but we still need to know those key components of that L LQ, Lambda, Mu, all those kinds of things, okay? So again, like I said, we talked about these waiting line arrangements and we sort of see the two types of, uh, of systems here, right? Both of these are multi-servers, uh, the difference being there's one line with many servers versus basically one system here, one server with its own line, another server with its own line, another server with its own line, and another server with its own line. We talk about multiple lines, really that's not a multi-server model. That is four single server models. A is a multi-server model. We have one single line feeding into many servers. Okay, so that distinction is very important. Just for fun, you can kind of look at the math and see, hey, wow, Ugh, that looks messy. Wouldn't want to be doing that over and over and over again. Looks very unfun. So really excited to learn about this waiting lines template that streamlines all this really messy activity. Uh, there's Little's Law. Now, this is very convenient, especially when you're doing uh, calculations by hand. Uh, these relationships here, uh, when we're using the waiting lines template, Little's Law is interesting in the sense that we can see how things are related to each other, uh, but we don't really use it for calculation. So when we look at those formulas for, for Little's Law, we see that there is a relationship, and it kind of makes sense, between the length of the line of the system, or the number average the number of people are waiting in the system on average and the waiting time and we kind of guess that you know what if one is longer the other one must be bigger too right and and that makes sense and then little laws little's law uh kind of shows us how that makes sense and how they're related okay last thing that we'll worry about is costing now costing is kind of the thing that people do the worst on for some reason. I don't understand why, but it seems to be a, comp, uh, a thing that people get tripped up on. And I will tell you right now, and you can write this down. And I tell people to write this down all the time. When we're talking about costing, right, we are gonna be talking about number of people in the line. Not how long an individual waits in the line, the number of people in the line. So we look at this cost of, of waiting right here, right? that is related to number of people waiting in the line. Uh, there are a number of things waiting in the line. Right? When we have too many things or too many people waiting in the line, we run the risk of dissatisfying our customers, they never come back, we lose them, and so on. So there's a cost of making people in line. They may go and, and be served somewhere else. Okay. So as we have more servers, which is on our X, we can kind of think, okay, yeah, the cost of waiting is going to go down because there's going to be less people waiting. That makes sense, right? But it's a nonlinear relationship. So just simply adding servers doesn't necessarily uh, reduce the costs directly. There's a relationship, but it's not linear. Okay. We go from one server to two servers, that'll drop our cost of waiting quite a bit more than we go from two to three and then from three to four and so on. Our, our key sort of thing we want to keep in mind, and this is what our goal is and what our objective is, we want to minimize those costs. Right? We minimize those costs by reducing the cost of waiting, but as we reduce the cost of waiting, the cost of service goes up because we have to pay for more servers. All right, so we've got that trade-off working out. And we saw this a little bit in play when we started talking about economic order quantities. And so we're trying to balance out those two things. Um, 
and we'll do some uh, costs and examples. These are very, very important. Uh, and we'll, I'll do this in another little clip. Okay. So it'll be a couple of series of clips in this particular unit. Okay. Finite service uh, model. This is pretty straightforward to do when we're when we have the template. The key thing is the key thing is to recognize that it's a finite that it has a finite customer population. That is the key thing. Working with the with the math, working with the template, not that big a deal. We recognize that we have a finite number of customers. So this requires us to have an ability to look at the problem and see who's the server, who's the customers. And sometimes it's not obvious. So with a bank, eight copy machines located in various offices uh, all throughout the building. Each machine is used continuously, has a single average time between failures of two weeks. The bank has one technician who can repair the three machines in a week. Right? So when we read that, we have to think of who's the server and who's the customer. In this case, we're talking about repair. Who does the repair? That is the server. Who does the repair here? The technician. Who gets the service? Who gets the service is the bank machines or the copy machines, excuse me. So the copy machines receive the service. The technician provides the service. So the technician is the server. So we have one technician. We have a one server model here. That is very important to recognize. Okay, average time between failures is two weeks, so that gives us a little bit of insight into their arrivals. And the bank has one technician who could repair three three machines in a week. Okay, so again, now we have service rates, we have arrival rates. We can uh, start to work with our model, and I'll do an example of working with that model in another clip. Okay, so last to wrap it all up, a couple issues. We have our arrivals. We're focusing on number of arrivals. How can we manage that, right? Uh, we can increase the number of arrivals through advertising, promotions, pricing, and appointments. So we can adjust it up or down, really, depending on how we approach those particular uh, avenues. Reducing variability is always important. Right? The whole reason why we do a forecast is we want to reduce the variability in, in potential sales so that we can plan better. No different here, right? Um, service, on the service side, number of service, so we can adjust the capa system capacity. But then we could also start working on the number of customers that a server can deal with in a certain time period. And that's where things like training, incentives, and so on come into play. Uh, we could split up into the number of phases right, to process things faster. And again, as always, we can reduce variability. Okay. Uh, we have a priority rule, decide whether to allow preemption. And we can focus in on customer perceptions, which then gets now into the next unit, which is the psychology of waiting lines. I'll let you read that. Some of it sort of makes sense. It's very readable stuff. Uh, but it's uh, it's very, very cool, and I'm so sad that we don't get to discuss this in class.